So good morning. I thank you that you got a little bit more enthusiastic when Kaz was saying you're looking forward. I'm thinking, oh no, nobody wants to hear it this morning. I've titled the message this morning, Discovering Me. So this is not a, uh, a message where it's all about Murray. It's really what you could say is discovering you. I, I, I pray that at some stage in the next sort of 30 minutes or so, that you will start to recognise either who you have been created to be or how you can discern that for yourself. But real quick, right up front, what I plan to do this morning is give you two ways that, um, that God has wired you to live out the rest of your life with a life of purpose, a life of destiny and a life of fulfilment. Who wants that? Who wants purpose, destiny and fulfilment in your life? Yeah. Well, the goal today is to give you two ways that you can go on a journey of discovering that for yourself. Let me start by asking a question. Have you ever felt like a, a square peg in a round hole? Ever, ever felt in life, maybe it's, maybe it's in, in a relationship, maybe it's in your workplace, maybe you walk into a room and you kind of just go, oh, man, I just feel so awkward, I feel out of place. I remember one time, I, my eldest daughter Brooke and her husband are here this morning, I remember one time I felt like this with Brooke. She was only probably, uh, she was still in primary school and Brooke used to do ballet. And I remember one day going to a ballet concert. How many people have been to ballet concerts? <laughs> the, the ladies went, yep, and the guys went, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So guys, you know, you know where I'm going now. So we walked into the concert. You know what they do? They always plan that if your daughter is in something or your son is in something, a dance company, it's always, there's one act in the, at the start, one in the middle and one near the end. So you can't watch your son or daughter and then go home. <coughs> Don't they? <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm just like, I'm loving it when Brooke's on. But for the rest of the, I don't know how long it was, my goodness gracious, I felt like a fish out of water. It just wasn't me. It wasn't my environment. Loved seeing my little girl dancing, but outside of that, felt like a fish out of water. There may be a time where you can think of it for you, where there's just something doesn't sit right with you, or you're just going through the, the motions, or maybe there's times in your life where you don't feel like there's any purpose to what you're doing and what you're about. Probably most of us in this room have asked What's the reason for my life? What, do I actually have a purpose? Well, the good news is you do. I want to start with this premise. You have a purpose. No one here was an accident. You may not have been planned by mum and dad, but God knew you were before you were born, not just to say you're going to have a life and then you're going to die. I'm going to give you, he says, a purpose. Let's look at it. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 is the core text around which this message flows. And I'm going to read this morning and do something a bit different. I'm going to read from a paraphrase version. I'm going to read from the message version, which is a paraphrase version. And I don't usually do this with a core text, but I want you to understand and I want it to resonate in a different way because many of us would have read this before. Some of us may never have read this, but it may resonate in a different way. Paul's writing to the church and he says this. He says, for everything, absolutely everything... Does that disclude anything? No, does it? Everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything. I think he makes it pretty clear that he's saying everything, yeah? Everything got started in him, God. Got started in God and, get this, finds its place. Another, for, another version says, finds its purpose in him, in God. Everything finds its purpose in God. Well, that's a great start. I'm in everything. My purpose is in God. You're in everything. Your purpose is in God. Let's keep reading. He was there before God, was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. When it comes to the church, he organises it and holds it together like a head does a body. God was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there towering far above everything and everyone. So spacious is God, so roomy that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Everything finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, Jesus' death, his blood that poured out down from the cross. 
Really, our prayer this morning should not be, do I have a purpose? Our prayer should be, thank you, God, that you made me with a purpose. Help me to discover what that is. Help me to understand what that is. The good news is, every single one of us has a purpose. God has a plan for your life. He's got a plan for your life. How amazing is that? He's got a plan for your life. Maddie shared a scripture this morning out of Jeremiah that says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in the future. God has a plan for your life and my life. Jesus understood this. And he took a couple of guys who were feeling a little bit like maybe how you and I might be feeling this morning. Where you might feel like you're going through the motions. Where they felt like maybe their life or parts of their life was a little bit purposeless. Maybe they were feeling unfulfilled. And he changed their lives forever. He took a tax collector. Took a couple of fishermen who had jobs and sometimes they enjoyed their jobs and sometimes they didn't, but there wasn't this sense of fulfilment. And he called them and he said, come and follow me because I have a plan and purpose for your life. Come and follow me and watch what I can do in you and for you. He said to them, you may be enjoying what you're doing, but I've got more. Not more as in more to shove into your life, but more for you to experience in life. See, they'd never seen the truth of who they really were. These men and, in, and then women who fo- started following Jesus always saw their limitations of their lives. They always saw themselves a certain way. And Jesus was kind of saying, you know what? It's time to take the blinkers off and stop seeing yourself through your own eyes because you will always see the flaws. And he said to them, what would it look like for you to see yourself through God's eyes who created you for a purpose? He was saying it's time to start seeing yourself through the eyes of the Creator God. It's a bit like this. I've used this illustration before, probably not here, um, but some of you may have forgotten it anyway. It's, it's, it's like this in terms of how we see ourselves. I'm going to put an image on the screen in a moment, and, and I, want, I want you to have a look and really allow yourself to, to see the image and almost, almost describe to yourself. If you want to chat with the person next to you, that's fine. Describe the image. Just bring it up for me, Mitch. All right. So there's an image. And there's, it's, it's, it's an old man. Do you see the old man? Everybody, hands nice and high. This is interaction. We see the old man. You know, he's got ivy on his head. He's got a beard. He's probably, he looks indigenous. He could be an indigenous Australian. He's got those features. He looks like he's lived a bit of a tough life, doesn't he? Can you see him? Does everyone in the room see the old man? Awesome. Great. So we can see that and we can say, well, that's good. Murray just showed me a picture this morning of an old man. Well, I see the old man but I also see a young man and young woman kissing hands up anyone who sees the young man and woman woman kissing hands up who thinks Murray you had bad pizza last night there was something going on (laughs) I see a young man and young woman kissing I see Romeo and Juliet in the middle of that picture kissing all right hands nice and high now who sees Romeo and Juliet kissing or a few more hands all right what we're going to do now is I'm going to get you if you don't see them yet close your eyes I'm going to I'm going to shorten the image for you and when I say open them you'll see just an image of Romeo and Juliet but it'll be easy if you close your eyes first Mitch change the picture right now open your eyes looking for Romeo and Juliet kissing can you see them no (laughs) all right so this is Juliet's hair that's her eye that's her her face her chin her neck Romeo is here he's got black flowing hair his his neck is around here his arm is around her her arm is around him he's got a cape on who sees Romeo and uh, Juliet kissing whoa a few more hands who still thinks they're all on drugs (laughs) so I I could spend a bit more time if you want if you're sitting there going I'm super frustrated I need to see that I need to see this come and see me afterwards and I'll point it out my point My point is, when we first started, and I first, you better take that off, Mitch, because they're going to keep looking. When we first started, and I said, who sees the old man? We all put our hands up. When I said, who sees the young man, the young woman kissing? Maybe three or four people in the room saw it. Then over time, as you looked more, as you looked in detail, as I started to point things out, I could orderly hear, oh, yeah. I could hear the ah ahas. I could hear people starting to see what was there? Now, my question for you is, when did Romeo and Juliet enter the picture? Did they enter it when you saw it, or were they there all the time? They were there all the time. But you know what? If we hadn't gone through a little bit of understanding and looked deeper, 
Some of you would have left today and never seen them and just seen the old man. So here's the kicker. For some of us in our lives, we're living a life knowing the old man in us. The good news is there's a young man and young woman kissing that God wants to reveal in you. I know that sounds a bit freaky. <laughs> but God wants to reveal something he's placed in you that just needs a little bit of discernment, a little bit of, oh my goodness. I don't know about you, but I get excited about that. God's placed some stuff in me and some of that stuff I've had discernment on and some of the stuff I know about, but some I may not yet know about. And the good news is in this church, we want to help you to discover the way God's wired you. We want to help you to find the young man and young woman kissing. We want to bring what may be hidden at the moment out into the real world, out into light so you can see it. You see, the only way we can live a life of significance, the life that God has for you, the only way we can truly discover and live out the destiny that God has for us is to go to our Creator and say, God, would you show me how you've wired me? Would you remove the blinkers that I wear? Would you remove the things in my world that are stopping me seeing the real me? You see, God created everyone and everything with a purpose. Paul actually says, you and I are God's masterpiece, his workmanship. But you know, it's, sometimes it's easier to see the masterpiece and the workmanship, that young man and young woman kissing, that hidden thing. Sometimes it's easier to see it in others than it is in ourselves. So some of you may not know these names. I'm going to use some names of people in this room. Some of you may know them. Some of you may not know them. Don't stress if you don't. But I want you to help, to help you to say, to see, well, okay, yes, I see that in them. So maybe there's something in me. So when I think about people like Wayne Saddock or Jenny Brandy, there's something about this, this servant heart, this beautiful servant heart. Jenny serves you coffee almost every single Sunday. Wayne's here most Sundays setting up. He's not here this morning because he's ill. But they sent me a message apologising for not being here and they're ill. Normally here Sunday morning setting up. When I see someone like Mitch Newell, our, our youth coordinator, there's this faith that I see in him. That he says, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to set up for Friday night. We're just starting this thing out. I have no idea how many kids at youth are going to be here. But I'm believing in faith that God's going to bring them. And we're, what, three, four weeks in there, mate? Four weeks of meeting here. Let me tell you a story about that. I said to Mitch, I didn't get a chance to catch up with them after Friday. And so this morning I said, hey, Mitch, how did youth go Friday night? Big smile in this faith-filled man's face. And he says, it was great. We had about 25 youth, teenagers here. How many? Two, three? And two of them made decisions for Jesus. Come on. Here's a faith-filled man who sets this place up on a Friday not knowing if anyone's going to come. And he comes and they have great fun and he brings a word. Two young, young um, teenagers made decisions for Jesus. Faith-filled man. Love it. There's a lady called Alma in this place. And there's many others. But Alma, I want to point out, she's got a heart and a passion. There's something about the, the hand of God of prayer on her life. And she sees somebody come in the front. She'll come and pray for you. And, and she doesn't just pray words. She, she intercedes in situations and circumstances. We've got people like Rachel and, and Maddie who, who lead us in worship. And Sally who lead us in worship so beautifully. There's something in their lives. It's not just singing songs, but they lead us in a place of worship. People like Steve who we saw in the, on the, um, the video earlier who's just got a real passion for generosity. He's got a heart to, to say how can we grow, the, how can we advance the kingdom? What can I do to make a difference with my generous generosity, with my time and with my talent and with my finances? And then people like, like Liz, I mean you've got a list of things, those of you who know Liz, uh, Liz Hamilton who's our small groups pastor who this morning is probably out with kids again. She's our small groups pastor and our kids ministry is growing so much we've had to grow to an extra group and, so, and, and she's just out there saying I'm going to serve out there. She's got such a beautiful heart for people. She probably welcomed you if you were dropping your kids off this morning in your line trying to sign them in and I can go on and on and on about the different people. Lisa just got this incredible passion for teaching and for research and her small group doing an amazing job of unpacking the word of God in incredible ways. Rolf and Angela who've got a heart and a passion for encouragement always writing notes of encouragement to one another and I can go on and on Terry and Kathy with hospital the way they open their home up you know once a month first Sunday of every month the church is invited it's not just oh, a couple of people that we really like no no even the people we don't like no 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 they, they like everybody but it's open for everyone first Sunday of every month come back to our place 
Maybe not if it's pouring rain like today. Let's pray that Nick, the, the, first of Ju- uh, the first Sunday in June is not going to be like that. Have a heart. So the, what I want you to understand, what I want you to see and understand is we can see that in others. Did I say anything you disagree with? Those of you who know those people. No. So what I want to say is there's some of that in you. And we want, we want to help you to discover what God has already put in there. It's not, God, would you give me something? It's there. We want to help. And that's where I want to go this morning. See, <clears throat> excuse me. See, the Bible teaches that God uniquely wired every one of us in a certain way with a purpose. So, breaking it down, if you really want to know what it is, there are two questions you could ask yourself, of yourself, or maybe ask God of yourself. One, God, what am I good at? I know that sounds really, really obvious, but have you ever sat down and said, God, would you show me what I'm good at? And it doesn't have to be a big thing. It might be you're really good with people. You're really good at just communicating. You're really good at making people feel welcome. You're really good at tinkering with your hands. I don't want to say too many because then I leave all of the other gambit of things out. What am I good at? And secondly... What do you love to do? What do you love to do? I'm going to unpack those two things, those two questions. What am I good at? What do I love to do? See, what do people see and affirm in you like I just did? Because if you want to know what you're supposed to be doing, don't look out there. Because who God made you to be determines what he intends for you to do. Let me say that again. Who God made you to be, how God wired you, That determines what he wants you to do. So when we say, well, I'm not sure what I should be doing with my life. Where do I get purpose? Look at how God's wired you. Look at what he's done in you. You see, when we get to heaven, God's going to ask you two questions. He's going to ask you, what have you done with my son Jesus? Have you accepted him? Do you follow him? Is he Lord and Saviour, as Kaz said? And the second one is, what did you do with what I gave you? What have you done with Jesus? Have you put him in his right place in your life? And what have you done with what I've already given you? Your gifts, your abilities, your passions, your things you love to do, the things, the way God's wired you. What have you done with that? They're the two questions he's going to ask. He's not going to ask how much money you got in your bank. He's not going to ask what did you buy. He's not going to ask any of that stuff. I'm not saying that's wrong, but the two big questions he's going to ask you when you get to heaven. What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with what I gave you? Interesting. The world sees this differently, but I remember a song, um, Freddie Mercury, who was the lead singer of Queen, and in the 80s, he was the highest profile singer and performer in the world in the 80s, and most of us know he died of, of AIDS in 1991. One of the last songs he wrote on, his, on, in, on the Queen's Miracle album was a song titled, Does Anyone Know What We Are Living For? You see, you can have everything that the world brings, But if we don't connect with how God has made us and why he's made us, we're always going to ask that question. Well, God does know what we're living for and he wants you to know too. You see, you were created to add to life on this earth, not just to get something out of life. You were created to add, to bring something into this world, into life, not just to get. And that's what I want to talk about and look at today. See, Romans chapter 9 and verse 20 says this, What right do you have, a human being, to cross-examine God? The pot has no right to say to the potter, Why did you make me this shape? The potter can do what he likes with the clay, and God is the potter and we're the clay, and he's made us a certain way for a certain purpose. So it's time for you and I to look into our spiritual mirrors, if you like, and to discover what our unique shape is. What's that unique shape that God has made us into? And if you're taking notes, on Sunday the 5th of June, in two Sundays' time, we're going to be doing a thing after church called Discover. And it flows on from this message. And we're going to help you to discover. We're going to go practically on on you personally and helping you personally discover how God has wired you. And I'll get into that in a moment. 5th of June, Sunday the 5th of June, straight after church. But I said at the start, I wanna, I'm going to give you two things that you're going to leave today, having a greater understanding of what that purpose is. How can I fulfil the purposes for God? The first one is a question. What are my spiritual gifts and abilities? The first question we need to ask God is, what are my spiritual gifts? What are my abilities? 
I'm going to read out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about this whole idea of spiritual gifts. So if you've never heard of the term spiritual gifts or you're not sure what that means, rather than me explain it up front, let's look at the Apostle Paul and how he explains spiritual gifts to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about these special abilities the Spirit gives us, spiritual gifts. I don't want you to misunderstand this. And he goes on and he says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of all of them. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. You see, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Now he's writing to the church. So when he says each of us, he's saying spiritual gift is given to each of us, each, each, each Christian, everyone who's following Jesus. Spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. Um, The one spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person, he gives the ability to speak in unknown tongues, while another is given the ability to interpret what's been said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So, Broken down, definition of spiritual gift are a special ability given by the Holy Spirit to every believer to be used to serve others and to build up and strengthen the church and the kingdom. Bottom line is, if you're a follower of Jesus, God's promise is you not only have skills and abilities, you have spiritual gifts, at least one. And some of us are going, really? I didn't even know. And some of us are going, yeah, I know that, but I don't think I have because I've never seen them. And others go, yeah, yeah, I do. I do know that. And and I'm using them. But the reality is every single person who's a follower of Jesus who said, Jesus, would you lead my life? Along with Jesus coming, he bought by his spirit spiritual gifts for us to work out. So the question then becomes, church, what's your gift? What's your gift? Peter, when he was writing to believers again throughout Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, 60 years after Jesus, says this. He says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So you've been given a gift. The question is, have you received it? Have you opened it? Have you used it? Now, I could, I could get a gift now and open it up and say, but you know, some of us have got a spiritual gift and it's sitting away. We've never, actually, we've never actually opened it up to see what it is and started to use it. Perhaps today is a prompting around that. And, and there are so many spiritual gifts. I'm just going to read a few because some of you think spiritual gifts and you just think that list. Well, there's a list in Romans that talks about some other gifts. There's, a, there's another list in Corinthians. There's a list in Ephesians. Right through the scriptures, there's different lists of different abilities, spiritual gifts. Let me give you some that might resonate. Creativity, communication, evangelism, teaching, shepherding, mercy, generosity, wisdom, administration and organisation, helps, faith, discernment. That's just some of the many gifts of which one at least you have if you're a follower of Jesus. You know, I remember being taught this real quick. He said, the mate of mine who was teaching me this, he said, but he said, you've got to understand they're not trophies. Spiritual gifts are not trophies that you sit on a, bench, on a, on a wall and say, that's my gift. See my, see my gift? That's my gift. I get the gift of leadership. See, there it is. It's not a trophy. It's a tool. You should, you'll get to the point where you're using your gift and you don't even have to tell anyone about it because they see it. They see people following if it's a leadership gift. They see people gathering if it's an organisational gift. For you and for this church to be all that you've been created to be and all that we've been created to be, to be fulfilled in your life and to be fruitful in your life, one of the things that you and I have to do is we have to discover and use the gifts that we've been given. Now, I don't care whether you've just kicking the kicking the the, um, the tires of Christian faith or you've been a Christian a long time. Don't switch off because some of you go, yeah, I know, I know, I know my gifts. Well, maybe there's something that God's already always had in there you don't even realise. You've been a Christian 30, 40, 50, 60 years and he wants to bring it to the surface now. So I want you to lean in just as much as anyone else. So the first one is, what are my spiritual gifts? 
The second one, the second question that we want to ask is, where is my heart? What are my gifts? Where is my heart? Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart, protect your heart, because it determines the course of your life. Proverbs 27, 19 says, As a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the person. See, your heart reveals the real you. In fact, your heart determines why you say the things you do, why you feel the way you do, and why you act the way you do. Some of us, there are things in our heart that, you know, we just, we just get so passionate. And others are looking at, why are, you, why are you so passionate about this? But there's something about the way you've been wired where you just can't let it go. Or there's a burden that you carry around certain situations and circumstances. Well, maybe God's placed that in there for you for a purpose. Maybe you get upset about certain things or you get passionate about certain things because God's placed in your heart that passion or burden. See, some of us go, oh, well, that's just a feeling thing and you know, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't get driven by my feelings. Well, no, you shouldn't necessarily be driven by your feelings, but you should know what God's placed in your heart that drives you. What's your passion? What do you love doing? What, what switches you on? See, physiologically, we all have a unique heartbeat. If you want to bring up that first slide, Mitch, we all have a unique heartbeat, physiologically, every one of us. Now, many of you know, know this, some of you may, may or may not know this, we all know that we've got a unique fingerprint, yeah? If we all put our fingerprints down, our fingerprints are unique. Even twins can put their fingerprints down, they're going to be different. different. Well, I need to say to you, and I think the doctors and nurses in the house will agree with me, I hope they do, our heartbeat is the same. We have, each and every one of you has a, has a unique heartbeat. You know, the, I'm going to get very technical with you now. The uppy bits and the lowy bits are all different. Did you, you're following my te- technology there, good. The uppy, they're all different, but we all have a unique heartbeat. Hopefully, no one's heartbeat looks like this at the moment. We'd be in a bit of trouble if it sort of started to level out a little bit. Hopefully, that's not the case and we'll bring you back to life again. But, but we all have a unique heartbeat that looks something like that. And in the same way, God has given you a unique emotional heartbeat. So every time you see a heartbeat like that, I want you to think about the fact that, yes, you have a unique physiological heartbeat, but you have a unique emotional heartbeat that God has given, where sometimes that heartbeat races because of what God's placed in you, about what he wants you to be passionate about. Some of us intrinsically care about some things and not about others. I remember when we were at Kasnoa Youth Pastors and, and uh, we'd taken our kids to Moomba, which in Melbourne at about February, I think, time of year, is a big, big thing that they do in the city and they have show bags. And we took all the youth kids there. And we're on the train about to come home after a big day and kids had show bags and things. And I looked over to Kaz and she's crying. I'm like, what's wrong? What's happened? What, what, what? Somebody said something to you. What's going on? What's, what's wrong? And she pointed. And there was a lady whom I just walked past who was pushing a shopping trolley and she was obviously somebody who, had, who lived on the streets and she was going through the rubbish bins and she was taking things out of the, you know, half-eaten apples and things out of the, and putting it into, into the shopping trolley. And Kaz saw this person and was just in tears. Her heart was broken. And I, please don't judge me, I walked past her and didn't even really notice her. Now, I'm going to say, is someone right or wrong? I probably should have noticed her. But Kaz has a heart of mercy. There is something that God's placed in her heart where she sees those in need and not only sees it, says, what can I do to make a difference? And many of you know Kaz, um, almost 20 years ago, now set up an organisation called Go Beyond All Borders, where she now, her organisation now provides fresh water for uh, slum areas in Kenya. She takes people on trips to, to Kenya to visit um, boarding schools where kids who have nothing and we, we support schools where kids normally who wouldn't get an education are now getting an education. They're coming off the slums and getting an education because there's this, this home run by a Christian woman that we support. Well, all that happened because God showed Kaz her merciful heart and she said, I want to try and make a difference. So something so small can grow into something significant if you allow it. I'm not saying we're all called to do that, but some of us are because of the way that we've been wired. Revelation 17, 17 says, God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose. God has placed stuff in your heart, a burden or a passion, 
so you can help to accomplish his purposes. Here's a weird one. I love sport. I'm passionate about sport. I love it. I played sport at a high level. I've coached sport. But there was something about that. I love the mateship in sport. I love the connectedness within sport. And I thought, well, God, if you've wired me this way, then how can I use it for you? And so in my coaching, I started to think, not only teaching these kids how to play the game, but teaching them more about life. And so I did that. And then I went on and did sports chaplaincy, where I, I was part of um, chaplaincy with the National Basketball League. With, with Before Melbourne United, there was the Melbourne Tigers with the Gazers. Well, I was the sports chaplain of the Melbourne Tigers, where I I was able to be there, support players who were injured and get alongside players and just be there to answer their questions and and be able to help them in their spiritual journey. Passionate about sport, how can I use this for you? God opened doors of opportunity. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what it is. It's how can you use it to be fulfilled and fruitful to advance the kingdom of God. So what's the fire in your belly? What's the passion? What keeps you talking late into the night? What gets you excited or enthusiastic? When you're normally going to bed, you're up talking, you're thinking, oh, I love this stuff. Or what burdens you? What makes you cry? What what breaks your heart? They're the questions to be asking God. Maybe Maybe it's kids. Maybe it's hurting and the needy. Maybe it's the marginalized. Maybe it's women, issues around women. Maybe it's marriages and healthy marriages. Maybe it's teaching. Maybe it's business leaders and business or sport or the arts or God's word or kids or people who don't know Jesus, or youth. You see, I haven't spiritualised at all. I'm just saying, whatever it is, maybe take that to God and say, God, is, is this a burden or a passion you've given me? And can I use this for you? Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you, God working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases Him. To do what pleases Him. God's put something in your heart to do what pleases Him. Some of you have never heard this message before and you're going, really? So I'm passionate about about food and cooking and that could be something God's placed in there? Maybe. It's not what it is, it's what are you going to do with it? It's not what it is, it's what are you going to do with it? Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15 says, but even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvellous grace. What do you love to do? Not sure? Well, let us help you find out. That first Sunday in June, we're going to do this Discover course. And part of the Discover course is we're going to sit down with you and you're going to do a spiritual gift assessment. You, for you. What are my gifts? And part of it will be, let's sit down, let's help you to see the things in your life so far, no matter how long or how short it is. What are the things that burden you? What are the things that you get fired up and passionate about? And then we're going to sit down with you afterwards, one-on-one. And we're going to help you to say, well, what do you think God might be saying? Can we pray together? I am, Kaz and I are super passionate about this. One of my greatest desires in life in ministry is see you to be all you're created to be. I want to get to the end of my days and know that I've made a difference in individuals' lives, that they not only know God deeper and know God well and know God better than ever before, but they also understand why He has put them on the earth. So this is going to be something as a church we're going to be passionate about, helping you and helping others discover your calling, discovering your destiny, discover your, that's what we call it, discover, discover your purpose, discover your gifts and live them out. Not as trophies on a wall to say, that, that, that's me. But people see you because of what you do in your workplace, in your relationships, in the life of the church. You and I are shaped to serve. We all have different shapes, not just physical shapes. But we have different shapes in the way God's wired us. We want to help you to discover those shapes. We want to help you to be fulfilled and fruitful in your life. It's what Jesus did. Jesus did this with his disciples. He said, come follow me. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. And then as they went along, he was teaching them and showing them not only who he was, not only who God was, but he was showing them who God was in them. So that Peter could rise up and be the man, not just the fisherman, but the man God called him to be. So that Andrew could understand the truth of who God was, not just there, but in him. And so on, and so on, and so on. And that's, that's what God's desire is for you. 
How do we discover? Well, we can do a discover course. Secondly, just step in and give it a try. If you're passionate about something, if you think you might have a gift in something, far better to discover your gift by doing. Just get out and give it a crack. Hey, Murray, can you give me a hand? I'd love, I, think, I think this is a gift. I think this is a passion. Where do I go? What do I do next? Just get involved. I, I received an email a few years ago, or Kaz and I received an email a few years ago from a, fir- a person who attended our church down in Melbourne for the first time. Only been once. Came from another church. And they wrote this, and I love the heart, because this is the heart of someone who says, I just want to serve with how God's made me. He said, Murray, hi, Murray and Carolyn. Carolyn, wow. he didn't know you very well. He would have said Kaz, like you all say. Um, Thank you very much for having me and my family at church on Sunday. We loved it. It was fantastic. We'd love to come back and be a part of it. It'd be great to have a chat with you at some stage to say hi and talk about how we can get involved. We really like to put our hands to the plough and serve with our gifts and our passions wherever we can. God bless. I just read that and my heart just leapt. And as I was preparing, I was reminded of that and found it. Because that's, that's the heart God wants us to have. What's my role? What's my gift? What's my passion? And how do I use it to advance the kingdom? Let me close with this passage of Scripture that Paul writes to his little, his young protege, Timothy. And he says this, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. And he did this not because we deserve it, He gave us these gifts and abilities and passions, not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from the beginning or before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. See, God has given you gifts and passions because of his grace and his love for you, not because you deserve it. You're sitting here going, I don't deserve gifts from God. Gee whiz, I don't even know him very well. None of us deserve it. God is such a gracious God that he's wired you He's wired you. Not just the person next to you, not just the person that you see that have got obvious gifts. He's wired you for a purpose. And He's given you gifts and He's given you passions. He's got an amazing plan and purpose for your life. He's asking you to follow Him and to trust Him. So what dream has God given you? What's He laid out for you? Because you mightn't feel it, but you're special. In God's eyes, in God's eyes, you are special. I wasn't going to read this, but I am. I close with this. It's, a, it's just a, something I found. It's anonymous. I don't even know who wrote it. But I love it because it helps you and I to see ourselves through God. This is how God sees you. Receive this. I'm special. In all the world, there is nobody like me. Since the beginning of time, there's never been another person like me. Nobody has my smile. Nobody has my eyes, my nose, my hair, my hands, my voice. I'm special. No one can be found who has my handwriting. Nobody anywhere has my tastes for food or music or art. No one sees things just as I see them. In all of time, there has been no one who laughs like me. No one who cries like me. And what makes me laugh and cry will never provoke identical laughter and tears from anybody else, ever. No one reacts to any situation just as I would react. I'm special. I'm the only one in all of creation who has my set of abilities and gifts and passions. No, there will always be somebody who is better at one of the things that I'm good at. But no one in the universe can reach the quality of my combination of talents, ideas, abilities and feelings. Like a room full of musical instruments, some may excel alone, but none match the symphony sound when all are played together. I'm special and I'm rare. And as in all rarity, there is great value. Because of my great value, I need not attempt to imitate others. I will accept, yes, celebrate my differences. I'm special and I'm beginning to realise it's no accident that I'm special. 
I'm beginning to see that God made me special for a very special purpose. He must have a job for me that no one else can do like I can. Out of the billions of applicants, only one is qualified. Only one has that right combination of what it takes. And that one is you. Because in God's eyes, you're special. Let's pray.